Okay, so going back now to the wars of religion in France. Uh, in, these, in this first war, so we were talking about, of course, there, there were multiple, they're called the wars of religions because there were, it was not just one of them, there were multiple ones. The first, uh, in the first one, I mean, these are really like, civil wars, uh, uh, Antoine de, de Bourbon, uh, King of Navarre, who's returned to the Catholic cause we talked about earlier, died of a wound re, uh, received at the siege of Rouen in 1562. So, Remember, we, someone asked if that was if the King of Navarre. Even for some reason, I didn't give his name earlier. Uh, was, uh, if that was asked if that was the famous uh, Henry IV who converted in order to become king. Does anybody know his his famous quote? When he d he decided to become a Catholic in order to become king. Does anybody know what it was? I guess yes. Yes, that's right. That's what he said. So he was he, was, he stood on a, probably a hill overlooking Paris and. Saw this, saw you know, the magnificent city. Said, eh, it's worth going to mass for that." So, so it doesn't seem that uh, if if he had a sincere conversion, it was, it was later on. <laughs> it was after that, because uh, it was clearly um, for political reasons that he decided to abandon Protestantism and embrace the the true faith. But uh, it's not to say that he was. You know, I I don't know whether he ever had a you know, uh, more sincere conversion later on. But I'd have to look into that. Okay, so uh, Condé, who was at the head of a body of German Lutherans, was marching upon Paris uh, with the intention of taking it by surprise uh, when he met the Catholic army under the constable Montmorency and the Duke of Guise, the Duc de Guise. So the Condé, does anybody remember, I, I mentioned last time something that he said after the, uh, the, the, called the massacre of Vazi. Anybody remember what he said? <laughs> that Caesar has crossed the Rubicon. <laughs> remember that? Anybody remember what the Rubicon was? <laughs> All right, <good. laughs> All right, okay, yeah, right, right. Well, north of Rome, yeah, actually south of Ravenna. But, um, north of Rome, that, yes, you cross. But see, people remember something. <laughs> something from this class. <laughs> Maybe we should have a secular history class, too. Anybody, everybody take a history class before coming here? <laughs> Nobody seems to remember <laughs> the answers to these questions. Uh, anyway. There's also, actually, I remember seeing in a, a film about the American Civil War, a uh, scene in which the one point the Union Army, they're crossing the, the, the Rappahannock River, which is near Fredericksburg, in, Vir in actually in Virginia. They're crossing it to attack the town and the Confederate Army and the no, who were, they were stationed beyond it. And in this scene in the film, they have one of the Union officers who had been a, it's a true story, actually had been a, a college professor in Maine and ended up becoming a war hero later on, giving this a recitation <laughs> from Julius Caesar as he's crossing the Rubicon uh, to, make, to make the moment seem dramatic that they're doing the same thing as Caesar did, basically, invading that they consider their own country. Uh, so it's a lot of, that, that imagery of crossing the Rubicon is used quite a bit. Yeah, for some reason, the uh, yes, the, well, for for good reason, the uh, you know, ancient Roman uh, military imagery is really stuck around. Like like Napoleon had himself uh, dressed up like uh, like Caesar at a certain point. There's a painting of him. He's all dressed up like Caesar with the laurel wreaths of victory and everything. So, no, there's this undying admiration for Roman military valor, <laughs> less down the millennia. Anyway. All that because of the Condé marching, uh, trying to take, wanting to take Paris by surprise. So in that particular battle, the Catholics emerged as the masters of the field. Uh, and the Protestants, during the battle, captured a marshal, Saint-André, I think we mentioned him before. Uh, they fell into his hands, and they murdered him afterwards. Uh, well, on the other hand, the, the Duke de Guise, on the Catholic side, shared his table and you know, lodgings. He, he, he was hospitable to the, the Prince of Condé, who was you know, commander of the opposite side. Uh, he, he was captured in the battle and was treated very nicely. Uh, so the war after that, so the Prince of Condé fell and was taken as a prisoner. So the war is carried on by uh, Coligny, 
So he's, he's now leading the Protestants who held the city of Orléans, uh, which made the, and made it the bulwark of Calvinism. So that became their headquarters. So the, the Duke of Guise, or Duke de Guise, who, uh, ha, who had been appointed by Catherine, remember Catherine de' Medici, is the one who's running things currently, uh, who was appointed as the Lieutenant General of the Kingdom, uh, determined to make a last ditch effort to crush the rebels, and accordingly hastened to invest the city defended by the Admiral. So yes, Admiral Coligny was, you know, he was, was an Admiral, uh, to, you know, took charge of the Protestant side. And invest the city, again, that's an older use of the word. It doesn't mean that he poured a lot of money into it. <laughs> he invested in the, he means he besieged it, or he waylaid it militarily in an attempt to uh, free it from Protestant occupation. So he pressed his siege. Uh, he pressed the siege and was already in possession of a portion of the suburbs of the city when he was assassinated by a Calvinist and died while uttering a petition for the pardon of his murderer. So he's, he was killed in that siege. Uh, and, uh, and that was in February of 1563. And uh, the forgiveness that he had asked for his, uh, his murderer was not granted. <laughs> uh, when, in fact, when he was examined, this assassin was examined, he was interrogated, he implicated Coligny in the plot. So he was essentially, you know, he, he insinuated anyway that Coligny had sent him, or at least knew of his plans to assassinate uh, the Duc de Guise. So Coligny is a part of this. They come to that conclusion. Uh, the Admiral undertook to defend himself, but the, uh, uh, the apologies, and apology also meaning an explanation, uh, which he published, uh, Dara says has not cleared his memory from the infamous imputation. So he tried to defend himself from that, but uh, apparently it wasn't very convincing. So the, uh, the death of the, of, Duke de, of the Duke of Guise obliged the, tr the queen herself to treat with the rebels. So she had to deal with them directly, and she wanted the Duke de Guise to be the ones to deal with, to be the one to deal with them, but it turns out she had to do it herself because he was killed. And then there was finally an edict of Amboise in March of 1563. So uh, city Amboise. Which granted a general amnesty to the an amnesty to the Calvinists, with freedom of conscience and the public exercise of their worship, uh, in one town of each um, certain area. So, um, and we're familiar with an, what an amnesty is. To make sure everybody understands that we talk about granting amnesties. Anyone familiar with with what that is? It's essentially a declaration that you're you know, forgetting that a crime was committed. It's not quite the same thing as a, like a pardon. Uh, it's just basically forgetting we're just going to act as if that never happened. So they were basically just allowed to uh, fine you. You've been yes, uh, rising up in armed rebellion, but we'll just, we're just going to forget about that and you can just act like it didn't happen. It's not quite the same thing as a pardon. It's basically just a declaration that you're forgetting about it. Uh, but in, in spite of, even even with all of that, even with with all those concessions they got, uh, the hostilities were resumed in 1567. So Coligny and Condé formed the project of seizing the king. Uh, but uh, let's see, uh, but Catherine and Charles. Remember, Charles is still the. Um, it's Charles the ninth. Check. Yes, it's Charles the ninth. Uh, they uh, received an advance warning of this plot, this kidnapping plot. So they uh, ended up being able to escape from it. They ended up, again, they, were, they, were traveling. they weren't in Paris at the time. They learned about it, but then they were able to get back to, you know, to the capital with, the, with an escort of Swiss infantry. So there was another time in which uh, Swiss mercenaries figured prominently in, 
in, uh, got with regard to guarding French royalties. Anybody know what that occasion was? Well, for one thing, the Swiss were just used as mercenaries throughout. I mean, the papal Swiss guards were not the only occasion of monarchs having Swiss guards. They were uh, hired all over the place, all over Europe. It was typical that monarchs would have each his own Swiss guard. But there was one occasion, it was actually French Revolution, uh, right shortly before Louis XVI was beheaded. He had his Swiss guard, but he wouldn't allow them to, uh, to deal with the Paris mob because he didn't want to fire on his own people. Then they ended up chopping his head off. So that's another famous example of, of, uh, you know, of uh, Swiss, Swiss imperial or royal guards in this case. So you know, these troops, you know, these, Swiss, these Swiss soldiers and mercenaries who were under the command of Montmorency uh, presented so resolute an appearance that Condé feared to attack them openly and satisfied himself with harassing them during the long and tedious march. So he, he didn't want to take them on to, uh, head on. It would have been too much for whatever forces he had. So he just stuck to um, you know, being a nuisance, basically, uh, attacking them whenever he could, ambushing them and whatnot. So you know, this is what the Protestants are doing in France currently. So... Now we're seeing the beginnings of this is the second second civil war, second war of religion, you could call it. Um, the reformers uh, took, well, the Protestants uh, obtained possession of Rodrigo again and did not spare the cathedral in their madness this time. And the first, the first time they occupied it, they left the cathedral alone, but not this time. So they you know, sort of ravaged it, taken out all of its you know, valuables, everything. Uh, I'm not sure if they destroyed it completely, though. I have to check that. Uh, negotiations were opened, but proved fruitless. And on the 25th of October, you know, 1567, the royal army engaged the rebels, who had posted themselves in the plain of Saint-Denis, uh, as if uh, to bar the king in his own capital city. So, uh, Catholic arms were victorious, but the triumph cost the life of the constable Montmorency. You know, I'll write that out in just case you can't understand me. When... My best attempt to pronounce that. So in those, the Battle of Saint-Denis was called. After that, the Protestants were sufficiently defeated that they were actually finally brought to the negotiating table. And there was a treaty signed in March of 1568. But it was, Dara says, necessarily short amid the general exasperation which animated all parties. So essentially the only reason the Protestants came to any agreement at all was because they had been defeated, but... Everybody still hated everybody else. It was not, a, this was not going to be a lasting peace, and nobody thought it would. So it was in the middle of all of these troubles and disorders, as you know, we've seen most of the poets we studied this year have died in the middle of troubles and disorders of some sort. The pontificate of Pius IV closed in death on December 9th, 1565. And uh, Dallas, the last thing he says on this point is that God had prepared a successor worthy to carry on his work. So now we come to Pope St. Pius V. I'll give you his dates here. This he reigned from January 7th, 1566 through May 1st, 1572. 
So we saw, of course, we covered in quite some detail the, the enactment of the Council of Trent, which had systematized the, uh, the, the, in theory, all of the disciplinary reforms of the church. Of course, many dogmatic definitions, but also all of the disciplinary reforms which uh, the church needed. So, yeah, but it laid down the theory of it, still has to be applied. So St. Pius V undertook to ensure its application in its widest bearing to public morals. So in the Netherlands, he seconded, meaning he supported, the measures of order and repression decreed by Philip II against uh, rebels that were there, Protestant rebels, called Le, Le Gue, the, uh, these Get the spelling right, it's a little difficult. It's Protestant rebels. Who were being funded by Elizabeth of England. And she did a lot of that. Talked about that before. Also, I mentioned that she did, sponsored the, uh, the the maraudings of Francis Drake, but she actually knighted him afterwards. <laughs> so she gave him a promotion for that. And that was a mightily uh, uh, a mightily profitable journey for all of his investors, one of whom was the Queen, actually. Okay. Uh, and then he also. Uh, during his reign, saw the uh, uh, the external uh, conquest by a league against the Turks and the glorious victory of Lepanto. So we'll see. We'll see all this a little more later on. But it was the Battle of Lepanto, the famous battle, did take place during his reign. Does anybody remember? And we've talked about it before. Anybody remember who the the commander of the of the Catholic side was in that? Yes. Yes. I usually called Don Juan of Austria, but yes. Whose son was he? Does anybody remember? Nobody remembers? He was the illegitimate son of Charles V. I'm talking about that. He was not allowed to sit in the sanctuary because the royal family was allowed to sit in the sanctuary during Mass. He was not allowed to because he was illegitimate. No, he was still, he was the son of the emperor, so he was still um, a high ranking nobleman, but he was not considered part of the royal family. So he didn't have that particular honor. So, within the church, St. Pius V reformed the ecclesiastical administration, restored the unity of the liturgy, condemned the errors of bias, and stu stood up uh, against uh, moral corruption, and toiled with zeal to repress abuses, disorders, and crimes. So his reign could be looked at as one long contest, really. One struggle after another, whether against... Uh, Protestant rebels in Europe or against uh, 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 disciplinary abuses in the church, uh, uh, putting that down and imposing uh, new practices, uh, new, new disciplinary practices, uh, making the efforts to you know, restore the sacred liturgy, to reduce abuses in that regard. And then, of course, uh, coordinating things to um, bring about a victory against the Turks. <clears throat> So, interestingly, the influence of St. Charles Borromeo was paramount in the conclave, which met to elect a successor to his uncle, Pius IV. So, you may remember that when Pius IV made St. Charles Borromeo a cardinal, that uh, Cardinal Ghislieri opposed it. I mean, not, not in the sense that he could prevent it, but he... Uh, he, he told Pius IV, you shouldn't be making your, your, your nephew uh, a cardinal. For one thing, he's not old enough. For another, he's your nephew. <laughs> but now we see that it's um, St. Charles Borromeo, who is very much influential in making sure that Cardinal Gichleri is now elected. So uh, St. Charles Borromeo said, uh, I resolved to look into this election only to religion and faith. So, of course, for, a, for an Italian, that's quite remarkable that he put aside family interests. 
you know, because they were very much attached to family. So if he's saying, of course, well, as he would expect the saint to do, he declared he would only uh, pay attention to the needs of, to the good of the Catholic faith, uh, to, the, to the needs of the church. And he said further, and as I was acquainted with the piety, the irreproachable life, and the devout spirit of the Cardinal of Alessandria, Michael Ghislieri, I was convinced that the church could not be better governed than by him. So you have one saint here making sure that another saint gets elected pope. So the voice of the sacred college uh, ratified the choice of the saint. So in other words, all of the cardinals uh, agreed that it made perfect sense to elect Cardinal Ghislieri. So they, so they did so and they, they cast their ballots accordingly. And Cardinal Ghislieri was elected sovereign pontiff. As often happens when saints are uh, elected to the papacy, he was filled with the deepest grief and remained buried in mournful silence while his colleagues came forward to offer their congratulations. So, St. Pius X reacted very similarly to being elected pope. And you could, you could tell from reading the life of St. Pius X, he never wanted to be anything more than a parish priest. In fact, when he was a, a bishop of a diocese, which he, did, he was a, he, uh, he, he, he sort of, <laughs> he was one of those, uh, uh, he was one of the popes who rose up through the ranks, as it were, because he was originally was, was a farm boy and then became a parish priest, a diocesan bishop, then a cardinal. Uh, then, and in fact, as I recall, he, when he went to the Concord, which he was elected, he had bought, I think with borrowed money, <laughs> a round-trip ticket <laughs> back to, I think it was Venice, where he was uh, uh, cardinal archbishop, so he was expecting to come back. <laughs> he wasn't expecting to be elected. <laughs> So I guess he didn't need that return trip. Uh, but anyway, he, he was one of those, yes, he, he rose up through the ranks. He never wanted to be, uh, he never wanted to be Pope, obviously, as you wouldn't expect the saint would want to be. But at one point, even, yet, even when he was a, a diocesan bishop, he went to a church once, he was visiting one of the churches of his diocese, and the parish priest, well, it was time for confessions in the morning, and the parish priest was still in bed. So he was the bishop of the diocese, went and started hearing confessions. <laughs> For the for the priest who is in charge of the church, so probably last time that priest just slept in. <laughs> well, it's almost as good as the Gilmore was here. Uh, so, and Pius V, you know, so this is uh, you know, more than three hundred years before that, uh, three hundred well, actually, like, almost three hundred fifty years. Uh, when he was asked the cause of his melancholy, he replied that in the Dominican convent, where I always lived with God, I hoped to save my soul. When made cardinal bishop, I began to fear, but now, as pope, I almost despair of salvation. So, you know, exactly what you would expect a saint to say upon being elected pope. So for him, this is the worst possible thing that could have ever happened, but all good Catholics applauded his election. And they said that God has raised up to us another Paul IV. Of course, that we could say, of course, Paul IV came first, but now we could say when we study Paul IV that if that's true, then we could say that he's more like a, a Pius V who came before Pius V. <laughs> Uh, of course, Paul IV was never canonized. He's not saying he was a bad pope or anything, but he was just you know, never canonized. Whereas, of course, St. Pius V is the, uh, the only pope in, from, from this time, aside from St. Pius X, who, is, who has been canonized. So, yeah, the, generally, that's how good Catholics received the news of the election of Cardinal Ghislieri, but the Roman people, always causing trouble, uh, fearing the austere morality and well-known severity of the new pontiff, openly showed their apprehensions. So St. Pius V was informed of their fears and uh, replied that we trust in God and we hope so to reign that our people may feel more pain at our death than they do now at our accession. 
So clearly, though, he's uh, maybe he doesn't like this fact or, or he deplores it. Perhaps we could even say that the fact that he's been elected pope, but he's clearly determined to do the job. So his first measures were animated by his zeal for discipline, of which he gave so many proofs in the course of his pontificate. So he banished useless luxury, converted into alms the largesses which the sovereign pontiffs were accustomed to bestow at their accession, reformed the public morals, obliged bishops to residence. So again, once we saw that, Trent did declared that that, that that had to be done, that if you, if you are the ordinary of a diocese, you have to actually reside there. You can't just get all the benefits from it, all the revenues, without actually doing anything for that diocese. So you know, that was laid down in theory at Trent. Now he's enforcing that. He induced the cardinals to give the example of modesty and piety, you know, which is something you, uh, that makes sense to say to um, uh, cardinals who are um, Italians. <laughs> They like to, uh, rather, we've seen these cardinals being rather pompous. So he's uh, telling them they have to be examples of modesty and piety, not worldly splendor. Uh, he forbade uh, single combats, which were then displayed in public games. Abolished, about Dara says, the sale of indulgences, uh, any, I mean, of course, any abuse in the conferral of indulgences. And essentially gave everywhere force to the discipline and principles of the Council of Trent. So that that's interesting. That's an interesting point for forbidding single combats, uh, which were displayed in public games. There was uh, there, of course, you may have read so in the Middle Ages that there was a custom of uh, two sides. If there was a dispute over something and there was going to be a war, that two sides would choose a champion to fight each other. That's different. Because what he's condemning here is you know, essentially dueling just for the sake of the amusement of the spectators. That's clearly that's barbarous, uh, and exposing uh, the, the lives of those. Of course, they're doing it willingly, but still exposing the lives of those who are uh, partaking in that to you know, to, to being uh, destroyed or even to their, you know, or at the very least, to their being seriously injured, uh, to being maimed even for the, the sake of essentially just recreation. There's no proportion there. But in the case of in the Middle Ages, that could be justified. You have, instead of fighting a big expensive war in which many people die, you have two soldiers who essentially fight the war, not representative of each two sides, they fight the war. Although, of course, many times that would happen and then one side, the side that would lose would not, not, not abide by the results and they would end up fighting the war anyway. So, uh, but in theory and in principle, that if the people to actually abide by the terms that they agreed to beforehand, that could be justified. But they are, it's totally different from what he's condemning here. And I've also heard that, I think he, Pius V, I think it was Pius V, who, as I recall, he uh, condemned the, uh, the practice of bullfighting. <laughs> so I've heard, I'd have to actually look that up, but so I've heard. Uh... Okay, so he was, of course, a living example of the regularity which he urged upon others, and he observed the same strict discipline as when a simple religious. And of course, that we just talked about it, St. Pius V had been a Dominican, or he was a Dominican, and, and uh, it's because of him, in fact, that popes are now in our case, of course, uh, imposters, but they still wear the white cassock because of him. He was, he, of course, Dominican habit. <laughs> we talked about they were called the Black Friars in England, but that's because they wore their black outer coat. The habit itself is white. So he will continue to wear the white Dominican habit even after being elected pope, and popes after that followed suit. So that's why popes ever after that wore white cassock. Although uh, Bergoglio it must be cheap or something, because you can see his black pants through <laughs> his white casting. <laughs> Some pictures, anyway, you can see that. That's why I remember one in particular that was being blown up against his legs, and you could see he was wearing black pants underneath. It looked terrible. So it must be, must be cheap and thin. But anyway. But I did hear that he once got some kind of, he was named by some magazine somewhere as the best-dressed man of like, the year some years back. So... So much for you know, being you know, humble and everything. He's, he's the best dressed man of the year, according to some magazine. Anyway, that was years ago. Uh, but now it's just humility on display that he's always been so famous for, which is, of course, anything but humility. 
anyway, enough of, enough of anti-popes. Um, so there are uh, fasts, prayers, and ever-increasing occupations had nothing in them that could terrify his austerity. With indefatigable activity, he attended in person to the execution of his orders. So he had, uh, prior to being elected pope, he was given to practicing considerable asceticism, and that didn't change even with all of the, the, uh, the, the burdens of the papacy being dropped upon him, really, um, uh, in which he didn't want in any case. But it didn't stop his ascetical practices. And it didn't stop his uh, paying attention to, to, to personally seeing to the execution of all of his ref uh, reforms, putting into effect the reforms of Trent. So the, the treaty that we talked about earlier of uh, that, uh, but, uh, that was everybody knew would be short in, the, uh, in these, the French wars of religion was violated almost as soon as it was signed. So war broke out again anew. Uh, all the edicts in favor of the reformers were annulled. So the Protestants, all those concessions they got were now officially next thrown out, thrown out, discarded, made null and void. The profession of the Catholic faith was a necessary qualification in every candidate for public office. So that's better than what we have now. <laughs> it's almost required that you be a a liar and a cheater and a hypocrite <laughs> to get public office, at least in some places, among certain political parties. So St. Pius V, in the midst of this outbreak of new outbreak of war, encouraged Catherine de' Medici and the young king, Charles IX, to oppose, uh, with a strong resistance, the progress of heresy into their states. So he also, of course, had to take measures to ensure that the papal states, you know, various territories held by, uh, were subject to the pope, uh, were, of course, kept free from the same contagion of heresy. He furnished subsidies to the king of France to help him in his war against the Calvinists. So instead of, instead of spending money on worldly pomp, he's, he's giving subsidies to the empire of France, to the kingdom of France, who are in the midst of uh, fighting a war against these heretics. Uh, these Calvinists, uh, their, their numbers had lately been increased considerably by the accession of a number of English and German adventurers. So they're getting volunteers, volunteers, foreign volunteers to help them spread their heresy. That's something you see in wars generally, is in volunteers from nations that are perhaps neutral, but volunteering to fight in one or another, one of the other sides. You see that. So having been strengthened by those numbers, they were led by the Prince of Condé against the Catholic forces, who under Marshal Tavan, the, uh, the, the armies met uh, in uh, March of 1569, uh, the Calvinists were defeated again, and their leader paid with his life for all the bloodshed he had caused while fighting against his god and his king. So Conde finally bites the dust in this battle. But his death, yes. Uh, see, uh, yeah, I'm leaving out the names of the battles because we're not covering them in detail, but uh, it was near a place called Jarnac. I'll write that down for you if you want. Yeah, we're going through the military side of this you know, without too much details because, well, I'm not going to be testing you on that. Uh, but it's, it's still good to know basically what happened in these wars. Because um, they are wars of religion, we see Pius V is getting involved in it. So also in this time, Jeanne d'Albret, who's the widow of the King of Navarre, we saw earlier 
uh, died fighting, hastened to Cognac with, uh, with her son, whose name was uh, also was Henry, uh, it was, who was 16 years old then, and the uh, young son of Condé. Uh, so she, and of course this is the famous Henry IV. So, uh, she, I mean, of course, she, oh, she's, she's bringing them to these, you know, her son and also the son of uh, Condé to the Protestants um, and giving them over <laughs> to them to be, or to be uh, you know, introduced into the Protestant cause and fight and everything. Uh, he was, in fact, Henry IV was proclaimed the chief of the league. So he was immediately prominent. He's only 16, but he was uh, proclaimed uh, the chief of the league. And Coligny, we saw the Admiral Coligny commanded under him. So you know, the Calvinists are just, uh, we, of course, we don't have uh, you know, in depth descriptions of what exactly their state of their arms were and everything, but they, given the number of times they've been defeated, it seems that they were not. Uh, they were, seemed like they were probably a bunch of rabble <laughs> fighting against the organized armies of the Kingdom of France, which is why they're defeated so many times. Uh, but even so, I mean, at the same time, you do have you know, prominent officers like Admiral Coligny and the Prince of Condé on their side, but they just seem to be defeated an awful lot. Uh, the rout of the Calvinists was complete after further battles, and their cause would have fallen there had not the victorious leaders been divided amongst themselves. There was a similar uh, phenomenon after the Franco-Prussian War in which uh, Emperor Napoleon III was captured uh, by, the, um, uh, by the Prussians. Uh, the Catholics wanted to restore the Catholic monarchy after that, but, they could, but there were multiple uh, candidates for who could have been the next Catholic king and they couldn't agree on who it should be. <laughs> so it started the Third Republic, which has a horrible reputation for having persecuted the church. It started well. The first president of the French Third Republic was a Catholic, but uh, he had to resign after a time, and then everything just went terribly south after that. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah we'll, see, we'll see that, but that's you know, still centuries in the future. So the point is, at this point, here, and we're still in the 16th century, and the route of the Calvinists was complete, uh, but uh, they still they weren't totally finished because the, the victorious leaders, the Catholics, can't uh, agree amongst themselves about what to do. So, so Coligny repaired his, this this, thir, uh, this this most recent disaster for the Calvinists, and for the third time, an accommodation was proposed. So, it's still not total victory because the um, they couldn't follow up on their victory due to internal divisions. Catholics couldn't follow up on their victory. So there was another treaty at Saint-Germain-en-Laye. So I'll write that for you. Uh, it was signed on August 15, 1570. So 300 years before the Franco-Prussian War <laughs> was 1870. And also 300 years before what else? What other event? Famous event. Talked about it a lot. <laughs> Any guesses? 1570, yes. Yes. <laughs> I thought everybody would remember that by now. I've talked about the First Vatican Council so many times, about how it was interrupted by the, anybody? <laughs> Franco-Prussian War, does that sound familiar? <laughs> I guess I should never feel bad about repeating myself, ever. So the Calvinists obtained four places of security, La Rochelle, Cognac, Montauban, and La Charité. So four, four towns that they can... Uh, be safe in. Uh, there they were uh, able to enjoy you know, freedom of worship, you know, freedom to practice their uh, false worship uh, in two cities of each province. 
They were made capable of holding any public office and of aspiring to any dignity, civil, administrative, or military. So, not really, not good term. If you're a Catholic, this is bad news, <laughs> these terms that they're getting. So, essentially, their religious existence was officially recognized. So, that's what happened. Now we get, so it sounds bad, now we get St. Pius V's reaction to that. The Pope deplored these concessions, which were inexplicable to him, since the royal arms had lately been crowned with unvarying success. So, right, it's been a major battle after major battle. These Calvinists are being crushed. Why would all of a sudden you turn around and give them all of these concessions? It makes no sense. But the policy of Catherine de' Medici prevailed over the repeated counsels of the sovereign pontiff. So, bad news for France in disregarding the uh, advice from the Pope. So now, that's for, yes. Because oh, well, we, we talked about that earlier, that she wanted to maintain a, this balance uh, of power in the kingdom that she could control everybody. She wanted, uh, wanted to you know, sort of step back from it, be, had this certain distance from it, but wanted to be able to control these uh, by, by making sure that nobody got too powerful, wanted to control everybody by making sure that nobody was strong enough to you know, take over themselves. Policy similar to the, the the British adopted in later centuries of maintaining a balance of power on the continent in Europe. Nobody got too powerful, so it's true. If you look at it, say in the in the uh, 18th, 19th centuries, they fought alongside uh, Germans and um, uh, Austrians, etc. In fact, many of the of the uh, the soldiers in say the Duke of Wellington's army that was emerged victorious at Waterloo was largely made up of German mercenaries. So they fought against everybody, against w w alongside everybody against France because France was too powerful under Napoleon. But then, a hundred years later, during the First World War and of course during the Second World War, they fight alongside everybody else uh, uh, against Germany, who were then becoming too powerful. So, um, yeah, that has not, nothing to do with these French wars of religion, but it's just a, a similar policy that what basically what the British wanted in future centuries. Uh, in, on the continent of Europe. So Catherine de' Medici wants a similar setup now in the Kingdom of France. So that's what's happening on the continent. In, uh, in England, the efforts of the Pope to save Mary Stuart from the jealous hatred of Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, the infamous Queen of England, one who deserves, in fact, the title of bloody, were equally fruitless. So the misfortunes of the ill-fated widow of Francis II, because remember, uh, Mary Stuart had, had married Francis II of France, who died, so she had been, like Philip, like Philip II, King of Spain, had been the, the consort of the Queen of England, Mary Tudor, so Mary Stuart had been the the, the, the queen consort of France, the, the wife of uh, Francis II, but he died, so she's no longer in that position. The misfortune, so her misfortunes had uh, been uh, you know, um, a source of interest to the Holy See. You know, the St. Pius V wanted to you know, help her, because she's an, um, a devout Catholic, who is the best hope for, if she were to get to the throne of England, the best hope for that country. So the popes gave, uh, had given many proofs of their sympathy for her plight, uh, of course, and their, their, of their earnest wish to soothe the sufferings of the Queen of Scots. Uh, that, uh, this is Doris, that it is necessary here to speak of her as she was known in Rome where there was an earnest desire to obtain daily accounts of a life of tears and resignation, of a heroic captivity ending in martyrdom. So that's, that's Doris, who said, just express, uh, illustrating to what extent the Holy See, of course, St. Pius V not accepted in any way from uh, giving illustration of just the, the interest that the popes had in trying to help her in her, you know, situation of being you know, persecuted by Elizabeth. 
So Mary Stuart was the, the daughter of James V, King James V of Scotland. She, uh, never, she never knew him at all because she, uh, ex she became the Queen of Scotland when she was eight days old. Her father died eight days after she was born. So uh, the Regency, uh, she's one's going to be able to rule for decades, obviously. Uh, the Regency was entrusted to, uh, to a certain James Hamilton. <coughs> the young queen was betrothed to Francis II of France when she was 15 years old and uh, soon left her native mountains for France, to which the un, uh, undeathly, untimely death of her consort soon forced her to bid a last farewell. So and she became the queen consort of France, but then had to return back to, to, well, to Scotland after, after Francis II died. So on, on her return to Scotland, she was incessantly harassed by the machinations and secret plots fomented by the gold of Elizabeth. So Elizabeth was paying, and in the underhanded ways, she was paying people to give trouble to uh, her Catholic, you know, the Catholic Queen of Scotland. All right, we'll continue with this, the, the pressing story of Mary Stuart later. <clears throat> 